Uh, good afternoon. My name is Abhishek Vemuri, and I'm a student chair of the Committee on Lectures. And before we begin, I would like to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, uh, the Ames Laboratory, the National Fair Series, and the Committee on Lectures, both of which are funded by the government of the student body. It is my pleasure to welcome our special guest on behalf of all the students here, both undergraduate and graduate, who represent a wide range of majors, organizations, and areas of research. And now it is my special honor to introduce President Leith. Trained as a plant scientist, he served at three universities in teaching, research, and economic development posts before coming to Iowa State. Most recently, he served as vice president of research and sponsored programs, and then as interim vice president for academic planning for the 16 campus North Carolina system. And now would you all please join me in welcoming President Leith. Thank you, Abhishek. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm delighted to introduce a very special speaker. I'm also a little bit jealous of the many of you packed in here and standing because this is the, the day that I teach. Yes, the president still teaches. And uh, I'll have to leave a little bit early, but I will uh, get a report on what part I missed. But I'm really delighted to see the attendance here today for a really, really special guest. We're in the sunroom today, which is probably appropriate as one of the uh, Earth's great sources of energy and probably a great future source of energy because we're going to introduce one of the great energy policy makers in the world and a great scientist in his own right today to our Iowa State community. We are honored to welcome the United States Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, to Iowa State University today. He's our special guest lecturer. Dr. Chu is one of the nation's outstanding scientists and scientific leaders in energy and energy policy. He has served as the Secretary of Energy since 2009, leading the Department of Energy to a long list of very significant accomplishments over those years in helping our nation strengthen its energy programs, its research, and its energy security. He came to the position of Secretary of Energy following a stellar career as a scientist and research administrator. He is a co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, holder of numerous patents, former director of the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and former faculty member and research at, researcher at Stanford University, where he still maintains an active research program in atomic physics and related sciences. He also, as you would well imagine, has a long list of accolades and professional recognitions, including membership in the National Academy of Sciences. He holds 23 honorary doctorate degrees. It is truly a pleasure to have him here today. And one of the reasons we are so excited is because we have a very special relationship here at Iowa State with the United States Department of Energy's Ames Lab here on campus. We're especially proud of the lab. We're especially proud of Alex King, its directors, for all the years of significant partnerships. And one that gets more significant, which I'm going to remind many of you of because I think most of you know about this. Not only has the Ames Lab got a great history that really grew out of the nation's nuclear energy program, which today is a leader in many areas of physics and chemistry, but it's also a leader in rare earth materials and metals. And speaking of this topic, here is what I want to re-announce to the group. We have uh, been awarded a center grant of $120 million from the Department of Energy. It's a fantastic achievement for the Ames Lab. It's a fantastic achievement for our partnership, and we're thrilled, and I want to congratulate everyone and thank the Secretary for being here as part of this celebration. We're delighted to have the Secretary here as a guest lecturer in his visit, uh, and I'm going to turn the podium over to him so he can address this great audience. So thank you, and Mr. Secretary. So, thank you. Um, I, have to, I have to tell you a little bit of why it was so sudden. We were actually planning to come to Ames uh, a couple of weeks, about a month later. Um, and then um, uh, I was the, uh, de you know, the State of the Union message is tonight. Uh, I'm the designated person who's supposed to go away uh, to some undisclosed bunker. Um, <laughs> And so rather than go to some undisclosed bunker, <laughs> so I <I'd> come here. <laughs> uh, so that's why it came a little bit early. And uh, anyway, so um, 
Uh, I want to talk to you, it's not exactly the title, but it's close, The Role of Science and Innovation in Solving the Energy and Climate Change Challenges. And um, I'll, I'll return to this picture as I come near the end of the talk. So first I want to remind you of how innovation has really shaped the world. And I'm just going to focus, there are many, many things you can talk about. You can talk about communications, the telegraph, the telephone, all the uh, uh, communications go on. But let me focus a little bit on transportation. And um, it was actually an invention, not really, it was an improvement of the steam engine by James Watt. He didn't invent the first steam engine, but he invented the first efficient steam engine. And that really led the mark of many people say of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then you then began to transition from animal and human power to mechanical power based on burning of fossil fuels. And so you have this picture of an iron horse uh, next to this horse. So this is uh, really, that invention really started this transition because when no longer reliant on human or animal power, you can just do simply a lot of things you couldn't do before. One of my favorite pictures uh, of a, a storied um, battle uh, ship uh, of uh, HMS Termain, uh, it's being towed by an ugly steam, smoke belching, steam powered um, tugboat, if you will, being this elegant uh, sailing ship, uh, warship sailing ship, but being towed uh, to its final berth uh, to be broken up for scrap. And uh, it's a sort of a, a new age, uh, 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 either a setting of the sun uh, of uh, great sailing ships and the birth of steam-powered boats. Um, airplanes, um, uh, the invention of the airplane. Uh, Samuel Langley, a uh, very famous uh, scientist, astronomer, inventor, got a $50,000 grant from the War Department in 1898 to build the first airplane. This is, he decided he's going to launch it from a catapult uh, off of uh, uh, the Potomac uh, just to get it going. And the idea is that this plane would then uh, glide up. And, and so what happened in, in actual fact is it went like that. <laughs> uh, and after the second unsuccessful attempt at launching, um, Langley just gave up. It was 1903. He was in his 60s. This is too risky, it's too hard on my nerves. The pilot survived, but I'm out of here. 1903, okay? Nine days later, the Wright brothers succeeded without government support. <laughs> Members of Congress were outraged. <laughs> you can't pick winners, government can't pick winners. Okay, nothing's changed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in actual fact, there was a proliferation of a lot of companies, things of that nature. And airplanes didn't go off to a smooth start. In fact, the original company founded by Wright, and then there was a competition with Curtis. There was big wars. Finally came together. Lots of toing and froing. Companies formed. Companies failed. But in the end, it, was, uh, it made aviation history. The other thing I just want to remind you of is by 1914, the United States ruled the skies from uh, 1903 to 1907. The Wright brothers actually made a spectacular thing. They made it not only the first flight, but it was controlled. They can do figure eights. They can turn around. They can do stuff. Uh, and, but by 1914, and then they went to Europe on a tour because no one really believed some Americans and bicycle mechanics could do this. Uh, and then they convinced them, yes, it could be done. But by 1914, Europe had gotten the lead, so much so that when we joined the war, World War I, we were convinced, we, the United States, to build European-designed airplanes, not American-designed airplanes, because they were better. So it took a while to get back the lead. So just remember that. Leads come and go. Uh, but, once, but, it, but losing a lead doesn't mean it's lost forever. You can get it back. Henry Ford, now, um, he didn't invent the internal combustion engine or the automobile. He didn't even invent the first assembly line. He improved upon the assembly line. And, uh, and his dream, which was a very different model, Daimler and Benz uh, made the first automobile, but it was a hand-built product. It was only for a very small sliver of the population. And uh, Ford had a completely different business model. He said, we're going to make it high quality, low cost, assembly line manufacturing process so that every American can afford it. And in, I think it was the Model A, it got to a point, inflation-adjusted cost, 
it got to a point where his car would be the equivalent of today's uh, dollars, seven thousand dollars. It was pretty good. And, you know, it didn't go zero to sixty in seven seconds, but it was pretty good. Okay, so it was that, and uh, and then we became the leader in automobile manufacturing for at least a half a century. Lost the lead, trying to get it back. Can we get it back? Yes, if we have the will to get it back. All right. So these are innovations. Now, if you look, think about the transition in new technologies. The automobile was particularly fast in any energy transition from coal. Uh, to oil burning, that took a while. That was a very that was one of the fastest. Uh, but anything usually takes a while because you need infrastructure. But uh, here I show you pictures of New York City around 1890s. There were either horses or horse-drawn carriages uh, by Detroit 1920. Uh, it, there was a few street electric-powered streetcars left, uh, but mostly dominated by automobiles. And the automobile companies were buying up the streetcar companies to make sure that they wouldn't be competing. <laughs> they did this in Los Angeles, just in case you're, you want to know, uh, so that uh, public transportation uh, would not be there. You'd need an automobile. This is a, uh, a strategy. Anyway, uh, automobiles took over, but they took over, well, because they were superior technology. No, at the turn of the century, they were lambasted as uh, uh, hurling bombs uh, that could crash and catch on fire and explode and all these things. The horse and buggy lobby was really against automobiles. There were lots of companies that started in the early part of the 20th century that failed. Companies that, you know, new industries, new companies do fail, uh, and there's a consolidation. Uh, but there was an, a serious environmental pollution problem that also hastened the transition. It was beginning to be a better technology, but remember, you know, you have to build this infrastructure of fueling stations and roads and everything else. Uh, horses can go on pretty crappy paths, but automobiles need re reasonable roads. Okay, what was the pollution issue? The pollution issue is in New York City and Brooklyn in 1880, there were about 160,000 horses. They were producing three to four million pounds of horse manure a day and 40,000 gallons of urine a day. It was piling up everywhere in every vacant lot. Um, the uh, uh, fertilizer business was saturated, <laughs> many times so. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, new lines of business came up. Uh, kids with brooms would help um, genteel people across the street to sw sweep a path so they wouldn't have to step on the manure, but they could plow a little path. It was piling up so fast. Okay, an environmental problem uh, that hastened it, especially in cities. Um, we have a similar environmental problem. It's not quite as noticeable. Uh, it, the odor doesn't quite hit us, um, but it is an environmental problem, and that has to do with climate change. So this is data from four groups. The last one is this gray stuff, uh, which is a Berkeley group um, that actually undertook this study because they thought that the data was not improperly analyzed before in, the, in global climate change and uh, average temperature. They thought there were heat island effects. They thought there were selection effects because there may be more thermometers in cities than elsewhere not properly counted. And so they went in with the intent of disproving uh, the climate people who, who were publishing this data. They were funded by a very conservative person who really wanted to show that climate change was a bunch of bahui. And I know the per a person who led this group personally, and he loves being uh, curmudgeon and saying, no, I'm going to prove everyone else wrong. And after a year and a half, they said, oops, no, we agree. And in fact, they found data that went back not to 1850, but actually to 1800. So, so um, and because he was a serious scientist, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and so, you know, in the end, uh, data's data. And, but he really, he cut it differently. He tried very hard to see if there were any biases. All right, so let's focus on the last 30 years where the temperature range was the great, increase was the greatest. Um, first of all, let me just say that we do not understand in detail uh, what happens over 10 or even a 20 year period in climate. Uh, it's very, very complicated stuff. It has to do with upper atmosphere, lower atmosphere. It has to do with a lot of clouds and formation of clouds and how they interact 
and how they interact with the ocean currents. So on a short time scale, we don't have the predictive power we do. On a longer time scale, on a half a century time scale, on a century time scale, it gets pretty simple. It's called energy in, energy out. <laughs> okay? The, 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 the ocean currents, the El Nino, the that begins to kind of average out. So the first question is energy in, energy out. Well, we don't have that much quality data on energy in. We do have some quality data starting in the era of satellites. We, uh, the sun's energy hitting the Earth is a solar cycle of 11 years. That's the stuff at the bottom, the red curve at the bottom. And, and then that's a, a snapshot uh, from 1978 to 2000, and this goes now to 2012, uh, of the temperature rising. So uh, energy in baseline the same, the, apart from the 11-year cycle. Now, you then skeptics will say, oh, that's the visible energy, but what about sunspots? What about the ionizing radiation? What about all the other stuff? Well, the wonderful thing is the same satellite was measuring visible light, infrared light, solar flares, microwaves, the whole bit. The sunspots actually were a little bit less in one of the cycles but they still have an 11-year cycle. They're still essentially flat, okay? Now, as we accrue more and more data going in, this will get better and better, but certainly 1850, 1900, we didn't have this. But, but you know, over the last 30 years, this is pretty significant. The 30-year time period is getting to be longer scale. Um, so here's the atmosphere. Okay, so energy hitting Earth, same. And let's say, I, we don't know, I can't stand here and tell you that in 1850 it was the same, but, but there's other evidence, just, but the satellite data is really good stuff, uh, that it was the same. Energy out? Less. Why? Because um, this is the, this blue-purple is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere going back uh, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and then more rapidly over here, uh, the Industrial Revolution started here. Now, you might say, if you're skeptical, you say, well, that just happens to be a coincidence, that um, the CO2 is higher than it's been, and it turns out it's higher than it's been in the last uh, uh, 800,000 years. But, say, but those of you who know about climate paleontology know that uh, the CO2 and the temperature of the Earth has been going up and down. There have been... Uh, four or five cycles, and the earlier cycles really have nothing to do with humans. Humans weren't around except for the last part of one cycle. Uh, but, but the CO2 is higher than it was uh, certainly in the last 800,000 years, probably in the last 2 million years, but not higher. There was times in the past, 50, 200 million years ago, a long time ago, where there was a lot more CO2. Um, Antarctica was not f frozen either and the sea level was a lot higher, and it was a very different world, insects is big, but never mind that. Uh, but why, why, so is it more than just a coincidence that this recent rise in carbon dioxide has to do with humans? And let me show you some data that many people aren't familiar with. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon. It's made in the upper atmosphere, cosmic rays. The cosmic rays in this case are high-energy protons go and hit nitrogen in the upper atmosphere, and they transform the nitrogen-14 into carbon-14, all right? This is a radioactive thing. It decays 5,700-year half-life. That radioactive carbon drifts down into the lower atmosphere, gets mixed in with everything in the biosphere. You and I have incorporated carbon-14 in part because of the carbon-14 that's made way up there, and it's in our body and the plants do it, and everything does it, okay? Now, suppose we die, uh, and we're putting a really good sarcophagus and put away for a million years, or 20 million years. There will be no more carbon-14 left in our body. It will have decayed in maybe three or five lifetimes. So by 30,000 years, it's gone. By a million years, it's really gone. Now, suppose someone digs us up and uses us to fuel a power plant. Our carbon then gets put into the atmosphere again, but it has no carbon-14. 
Meanwhile, if if it's only the biosphere, trees grow, they they rot, they get reabsorbed by microbes, stuff grows in the ocean, it rots, it gets reabsorbed. On a 5,000-year time scale, you reach steady state. But if you now take another source of carbon that's been de-radioactive because it's been around under somewhere else, not exposed ultimately to the carbon-14 being made in the upper atmosphere, you dilute the, carb, the natural carbon-14 if you do enough of it, all right? So this blue curve is the CO2. This green curve is the amount of carbon-14 divided by the amount of carbon-12. The, the other curve is another story which is equally fascinating on carbon-13. It's a non-reactive isotope, but I'm going to skip it for now. So the carbon-14 starts to decline, seemingly getting diluted or something's happening, while the CO2 is increasing. Okay, But now you notice this record stops in 1955 or something like that. Let me show you more recent data. Look what happened in the late 50s, early 60s. The amount of carbon-14 raced up. Green curve is the northern hemisphere. Why? Atmospheric H-bomb testing made a lot of carbon-14. Uh, these oscillations are yearly oscillations that tell you the mixing time of the stratosphere with the biosphere. And so you can actually see the mixing. The delay time of southern hemisphere, that's SH, the blue curve versus green, northern hemisphere, is the delay time because there's an atmospheric mixing of the northern with the southern hemisphere that takes about a year, year and a half. It's just like uh, those of you who've read the book On the Beach many years ago or saw the movie, you know, it ends up the last survivors of Earth in the nuclear holocaust with some people in Australia and New Zealand. It's true. Uh, it takes a while for the cloud to get to the southern hemisphere, but this is a measurement. Then what you also see is the carbon-14 be absorbed by the northern hemisphere ocean and the southern hemisphere ocean. So this radioactive tracer is now actually helping us do detailed atmospheric and ocean mixing, but it's continuing to plunge, continuing to plunge. Okay, now, the interesting thing about this is it's still going down too fast for just mixing of the atmospheric H-bomb uh, testing with the ocean and the rest of the thing. But it is quantitatively consistent with the amount of fossil fuel we've put up in the atmosphere. It's ironic, but uh, Ralph Keeling is one of the leaders of this group in San Diego, is the son of the other Keeling that found the carbon oscillations uh, that told us the CO2 is warming up. Okay? The error bars are reasonably big. It's plus or minus 25%, and each year they're winnowing down. Okay? So this is kind of more of a smoking gun. You know, it appears to be fossil fuel. Okay, it's not a natural occurrence. I go back to it. If it's a natural occurrence and just cycling of trees and flora and fauna and all this other stuff, you just get a steady state of carbon-14 to carbon-12. But if you take it from somewhere else and liberate it, then it's different. Okay? And it just happens to be consistent with the amount of carbon we think we stuck up there from burning fossil fuel. Okay, so it's not just a coincidence. I can go on for several hours of of why there's growing evidence that this is human cause, at least a significant part of it, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to see sea levels are rising. We don't understand that. In uh, 10 years ago, we thought the sea level rise would follow the best estimate, this curve here, and these dotted lines over here and over here were the 90% uncertainty brackets of where we felt it's going to lie. And we have both tidal gauges and now satellite observations and oops, it's rising faster. It's getting outside, it's out a little bit, it's in the fringe of the probability. The probability of severe downpours and things, also in climate model prediction, we're also at the fringe. It's happening faster than we thought, okay? So that's another thing. We don't understand everything, <laughs> um, but not in a good way, <laughs> okay? Um, these are natural disasters. The data is not from... Uh, from um, environmentalists or people like this. This is data from a reinsurance company. These are insurance companies that insure insurance companies. And <laughs> if you get a big di natural disaster, a hurricane, uh, 
you know, the insurance companies can go belly up, so they have to have insurance, okay? So this is Munich Re, and they just look at, this is hardcore green eye shades sort of stuff, and they looked at geophysical events like earthquakes, that's, that's purple, and you see, you know, over, this is a 32-year period, yeah, it's pretty noisy data, but it's not really, you see no trend. You look at storms, you look at floods, it's this stuff, you look at what we call extreme events like extreme temperatures, either cold or low, or droughts or forest fires, you then see something else. You see a trend over the last 32 years. You can't really say with any conviction if you have one year of a horrible hurricane or something like that, that's not going to tell you anything, or even five years. But over 30 years, it begins to say, hmm, maybe this stuff is associated with what the climate models were predicting, by the, okay, but they were under-predicting. But never mind that. They were predicting. <clears throat> now, this is Hurricane Sandy descending on uh, New York. I just want to point out that this is a fake photo. <laughs> uh, you don't have uh, either that or the person on this uh, motorboat should have their head examined <laughs> when you see this descending. But actually, the real photo is not much different. Okay. And, and what Hurricane Sandy was and what Hurricane Irene were, were kind of different. The wind level was actually quite moderate. It was barely uh, Hurricane 1. It was mostly tropical storm. But what was different is they were humongous and they moved very slowly. And the water damage was what really caused uh, the damage. All right. And um, there were, here's a few other things just to remind you of. There was a heat wave in Europe 2003, most people don't realize, but 52,000 people died in that August heat wave, died, 52,000, because they had no air conditioning in Europe. Italy didn't report the 18,000 deaths until many years later. That was part of it. France knew they had over, well over 10,000 deaths within that month. It was August, okay? That's a lot. Um, Russia... Uh, temperature anomaly. The temperature anomaly just means it was uh, 26 degrees over the normal high of that year. And, and so 26 degrees is, um, you know, temperature variations in Iowa will never impress Iowans. Uh, <laughs> it remains. Uh, I understand that. <laughs> Both the hot, stinky summers and the cold, bitter winters. But it, when you're in Moscow and you go 26 degrees, above the normal highs, again, no air conditioning and no knowledge of how to adjust to hot temperature, you get a lot of deaths. You know, dehydration, all sorts of things. So there were ten to 15,000 deaths. Okay. Um, the Chicago heat wave was actually minor compared to this. Uh, there were 739 reported deaths, but there were 200 bodies that were not autopsied in Chicago. Uh, mostly in apartments, uh, non-air conditioned, poor people. Okay, so here's another thing. Uh, if we go on our present path, you have the red means ho very high probability, the orange high, yellow moderate. Uh, oh, let's see, where's Iowa? I was about here somewhere. You're on the edge. Uh, this is uh, fertile land becoming desert, and anybody... Uh, significantly west of Mississippi, if if you manage water and things like that, you're actually preparing for a lot of water stress in the coming decades. This is probably going to be the first impact in the world, the water stress uh, and the violent storms, because we're seeing that the desert line uh, in the Saharan desert line is very noticeable, and it's just it's just inching south. The malaria lines inch, uh, inching north. This is all documented, tabulated stuff. The health officials know this for the last couple decades, and it's just very visible. Okay, so something's changing. Losses. Well, there are a lot of human losses I just talked about, but there's financial losses. This goes back to uh, uh, Munich Re. Uh, the trend line, uh, uh, most of this is uninsured, and the vast majority is U.S. losses because we're a wealthy country and we put towns and cities near rivers and near coastal areas. And because we're so wealthy, we have the most losses. And so the trend line is about $170 billion a year, the vast majority in the United States. 
okay? And so we're paying for this as we speak, all right? Oil prices, uh, inflation adjusted, you know, they, these are the oil prices in 1996, they were spiked up, and then there was a big recession, it spiked down, now it's crawling up. Um, and this is the price of roughly $100 a barrel, and we don't know where it's gonna be in 2015 or 20. Uh, the, if you look at the Energy Information uh, Agency, which is part of the Department of Energy, it's an independent assessment of trying to make predictions, but take them with a grain of salt, like all predictions. But there's huge uncertainties in the price of oil. It could be, in today's dollars, it could be um, $280 a barrel, it could be $70 a barrel, okay? Um, but uh, when the price of oil goes up, we push this button, panic button. When the price of oil goes down, we push the snooze button. This is not a good energy policy, <laughs> okay? Now, a few facts. Last year, we spent about $430 billion in importing foreign oil. Now, the good news is our oil imports have fallen to a 25-year low because of fracking of uh, liquid natural gas products and oil. Uh, we are second in oil production except Russia. We may pass Saudi Arabia in the coming for a few years. Okay, so we're the second largest oil producer in the world, but yet we import 40%. Okay, and, um, and so despite the good news is that we're, um, there's also other good news. We're kind of flattening our use of oil. That's but part of that has to do with the fact that we're still in a, a recession. Uh, but uh, we spend a lot, billions more to keep the oil shipping lanes open and lives have been lost for access to oil. So what to do? Well, I just want to, many people have refused to say that, including a Saudi minister. Uh, the, the quote was, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Um, now, this is something I added. Uh, we transitioned to better solutions. So what's a better solution? A better solution is something as economical, but cleaner. Not more expensive, as cheap, but cleaner. All right? So we have, that's the energy challenge. Uh, now there's an old Hungarian saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there are two characters, Chinese, uh, YG, they, uh, I don't really know Chinese. One is a, a character f that means danger and the other means opportunity. So in every crisis slides opportunity. So there are opportunities here and so let me briefly describe what those opportunities are. Okay, so there are opportunities for improved technologies. I'm very briefly going to touch on energy efficiency and then clean energy sources. Um, so first energy efficiency. In the 1940s and 50s, refrigerators uh, looked like this. There was a cooling coil on top, the so-called, you know, it just was a replacement for uh, the ice box that used to have a hunk of ice. And um, as the refrigerators got bigger, and as they got to features, especially frost-free, uh, they began to consume a lot of energy. For those of you who don't know how frost-free works, you know, when I was a little kid growing up, we had a frost, you know, I'd have to, boil uh, tea kettles and put tea kettles in the refrigerator and put towels and, and chip away the ice but not break into the cooling coils and everything. Uh, and then, you know, this got that thick and then it was became very inefficient. And, you know, you might think, what a wonderful son that would, you know, do this. No, I wanted my ice cream hard. It was, <laughs> uh, so I was willing to do it. Um, Frost-free blows hot air into the refrigerator, melts the ice, a little sheen of ice, and then recools it. And it's, by its very nature, it uses more energy. This is actually blowing heat into the refrigerator. Okay. Standards started occurring. Appliance standards, minimum standards. And what happened was as soon as standards started going up, the efficiency zoomed way up. Now, everybody assumed if you apply standards, okay, if they're good standards, the cost of the refrigerator surely must go up, but the cost of owning the refrigerator and operating the electricity might go down, and maybe it's going to be cheaper in the end. So a couple of colleagues and I, over the last two years, started looking at deep sets of raw data. You know, this is what physicists do. It's 
counter to what economists do. They make models. We like data. <laughs> the blue curve, sorry if I've offended an economist. <laughs> Not really that sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so, so the blue curve is, is the uh, uh, levelized cost. That's the purchase price and the cost of electricity. The cost of electricity, not the cost, the consumer index cost, the cost of electricity. So we looked at the United States, uh, sp spent a lot of time doing this, and these are my co-authors on top. The red curve, now this is, the hollow symbols were before standards and afterwards was after standards. And the hollow curves were before standards and after standards. And you know something really funny about refrigerators? The cost of the refrigerator didn't go up. It continued to go down. This is what's called a learning curve. That means on the y-axis is price, but it's in a logarithmic scale, and on the x-axis is cumulative shipments of the refrigerator of a certain model, like a 18 cubic foot freezer on top. Um, a, lear a learning curve says if you double the production and shipments, the price goes down by a certain fraction, let's say 5% or 10%. Double again, it goes down another 10%. Goes, doubles again, it goes down another 10%. So if plotted on a log, log curve, you get a straight line. It turns out that learning curves are almost universal in anything technological, having agriculture, toasters, refrigerators, you name it, cars, you name it. You have to make quality adjustments uh, for things, but you can do that, and we also in this paper we uh, submitted also didn't make the quality adjustments. So, room air conditioners. Now, what do you see funny about this data? Uh, oops, uh, there's, we, we, looked at four, we looked at four things. We looked at room air conditioners, central air conditioning, refrigerators, and clothes washers. In three of the four places, the first cost price started to go down. We left as a free parameter. We said the program, you can fit either two slopes or one slope, and where the kink is, you decide. We're not going to prejudge it. And there was a striking correlation. When standards started, the cost went down, the first cost. Now, you can make all sorts of things. It could be a retooling issue, things like that. Who knows? But usually when uh, industries are forced to invest in themselves, they actually stay current and efficient. Okay? And if they don't, they don't. So anyway, this is remarkable. Efficiency didn't cost money. It saved money, both in the pr purchase price but also in the operation, dramatically. Airplanes have become much more efficient. Uh, this is the 787. Uh, it uses 30% of the fuel of a 707. And it flies a little bit faster. Improved aerodynamics, engines, materials. We did a lot to some of the background stuff. We work with uh, jet engine companies like GE and Pratt and & Whitney. The engines are 50% more fuel efficient. They're quieter. They're, uh, they're more fuel efficient. They use 50% less fuel for the amount of thrust generated. It's remarkable. Uh, and um, um, we, uh, high performance computing, working with these gen engine companies actually mean they can uh, optimize their designs on a supercomputer. And because it costs a million bucks for a couple hours to put an engine on just on a test stand. Okay. So uh, we have used supercomputers to streamline trucks. Uh, now, you've, within a couple of years, you see that these trucks have become very, very streamlined, and we look at the airflows. This is a calculation done at Oak Ridge. Remarkably, the work isn't done. It turns out if you slap this little piece of plastic, this thing right here, on the underside of a truck, um, the, the real one uh, can reduce drag by 12%, the cheap version, the value engineered version that it would cost $1,000 uh, uh, of cost and then a single person can snap it in place, could save about 5 to 10% of the diesel fuel. These big trucks go 100,000 miles a year. So for 1000 bucks you and $5 per gallon of diesel fuel, roughly, this is real money from a simple piece of snap-on plastic. Uh, we also use high-performance computers to uh, optimize, again, in silico. This is a Cummings diesel engine. Uh, this is a laser diagnostic, so we set up a test stand. We, we, we simulate the complex chemical reactions. In, this is the fuel injection 
simulation of the super And so this simulation worked so well that when they optimized and they did the design, they made one prototype, it worked according to simulation, and they just went into production. So this is another one of the things that we're trying to help U.S. industry do, that we're good at this, we're good at simulation, we're good at uh, uh, diagnostics, and so we can eliminate very expensive engineering cycles to make us more competitive. But it also, this happens to be a, a low pollution, very economical engine that Cummins now sells. Um, all sorts of other alloy stuff, material stuff, uh, a th you know, aluminum block, which is this cast aluminum, the A319 alloy is a standard alloy the automobile industry uses. You can do a little materials processing. Instead of putting a, a steel sleeve inside, you can now have a laser uh, implanted, um, not laser implanted, but laser conditioned surface that would be uh, better than the steel sleeve. But now it's an aluminum block. So um, electric vehicles, another efficiency. We're, our goal in, by 2022, in a decade, is that we want to make uh, an, a plug-in hybrid or an electric vehicle that can go about 150 real miles uh, as affordable as a car that goes, gets 40 miles to a gallon with the same performance, a five-passenger car. And so we said, and without subsidy, without rebate, can you do this? Is it possible? And so we got the president to um, uh, announce this. And you look at everything. You look at the advanced batteries. You look at the charging. You look at the lighter weighting. You look at the powertrain, everything. And um, these are, this is, an ener this is energy density, how much energy per unit weight and energy per unit volume. You want the highest energy per unit weight, the highest energy per unit volume, uh, and also the highest power. And these are uh, the existing lithium ion battery technologies are iron phosphate, they're cobalt oxide, they're manganese types. Uh, these are the ones that exist now. And over the last couple of years, the energy uh, has doubled. Uh, the price of battery systems has gone in half in the last five years. Uh, it's going to go in half another f five or ten years for sure. Uh, we're uh, investing in a bunch of companies hoping to double again and maybe triple uh, with no increase in cost. Um, we'll see if that happens. So this is the cost of batteries. Uh, in 2008, it was about $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Uh, uh, 2011, or two, it's... Um, 2012, rather, it's about 500. This is manufacturing costs only, not cost of plus profit. Uh, that's $500, and our target by 2022 is uh, $125. We could fail and maybe $200. It still would be terribly exciting, okay? Because it would transform the automotive industry, and uh, I would, uh, you know, you maybe want to stick with a plug-in hybrid. But around cities and suburban places, uh, you know, an EV would be fine. Uh, but um, it would also transform energy storage systems as well. It turns out that the battery system, we only use half the battery in, in these cars, the Chevy Volt, the Nissan Leaf, uh, because it's conservative, it's warranty issues, there's all sorts of things. And so it turns out that we have a new program in RPE that's looking at the battery system, better sensors, especially if you can sense internally within the battery pack rather than thermistors or something on the outside, you're much better off. You can push the battery more to its, quote, limits without and have a safer system. And so we're, we have a, a, a group that recognized that this is something that we should invest in that could so we're doing a number of things like that let me talk about clean energy sources um, this is the wind resources uh, in the United States at 50, 50 meter high tower that's a pretty tall tower whenever you see these uh, this purple the blue the R, the red the orange anything of that nature you're talking about very very good wind sources okay uh, you don't want to be investing in uh, dark green. It's not good wind sources, okay? But anything in this central swath in the United States and off the shores uh, are excellent resources. <clears throat> um, 
And the wind technology still continues to improve. They're getting taller and bigger, and they last longer, and they're more efficient. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a 2.3 megawatt turbine. Uh, it's, uh, let's see if I have, um, yeah. The Wright brothers' first flight was 37 meters. The Airbus 380, the big one, that double-decker, its wingspan is 80 meters. Um, the, uh, the diameter of uh, the ones on, the biggest ones being installed of the wind turbines are 93 meters. It's bigger than the wingspan of the 380, and uh, it's about three times longer than the first Wright Brothers flight. <laughs> Just the wingspan, okay? Um, now, there's a problem. Is the bigger they get, the harder it is to construct, and especially offshore, where size does matter, you want to get bigger and higher, uh, it's harder to maintain because once you have three-foot seas, it, you can't, it, higher than three-foot seas, you can't do anything. You can't lift the thing up. So we're trying to think of ways in order to improve the maintenance, especially the large offshore but even the, the eight or meter tall uh, ones in the U.S., you know, need a very high crane. So, so here's uh, an idea that I stuck on a Nature paper that came out in August. Um, this is this is the picture of this boat, you know, very very calm seas, lifting this um, 93 meter diameter blade, and then the nautical also weighs many tens of tons. Okay, this is an inchworm going up a tree. Also, if you think of how we build skyscrapers, we don't use cranes that stick up 100 stories. The crane is on top of the building. Okay? So either we have something inches up the tower or a, a little rickety structure that, that pins to the tower, which has to be very strong, that supports the crane. Okay? You don't need a standalone crane. And now in high seas, you don't care about it anymore. Free of charge, since I can't make money in the Department of Energy. Anyway, <laughs> so, but these are ideas that will come along and they'll figure it out. And, and there's all sorts of other ideas on better transforms, new things. Uh, in 2010, all 3% of electricity power went through power electronics, AC to DC converters, step up, step down, stuff like that. By 2030, 80% of electrical power goes through power electronics, like the thing that this computer goes, okay? So we are developing power electronics, very, very exciting stuff. Um, uh, for those electrical engineers in the audience will know th that you can now, we now have um, on the testing um, one megawatt transistors, single transistor control over megawatt. Very exciting stuff, okay? That means you can go higher in voltage in the cars, less copper, less weight, less cost, okay? Let me talk about solar energy. Now, I've been accused of being overly fond of solar energy. There was an article in The Onion that appeared February 7, 2013. It says, <laughs> hungover energy secretary wakes up next to solar panel. This, was, this made the press uh, in February 2013. February 7th, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the article says, and I'll read it to you, Washington had, sources have reported that the following, a long night of carousing in a series of DC watering holes, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu awoke Thursday morning to find himself sleeping next to a giant solar panel he had met during the previous evening. Quote, oh Christ, what the hell did I do last night? Chu is said to have muttered to himself while clutching his aching hand and grimacing at the partially blanketed 18 square foot photovoltaic solar module whose manufacturing he was reportedly unable to recall. <laughs> it goes on to say, this is quote, quote quoting me, this is bad. I really need to stop doing this. I gotta get this thing out of here before my wife comes home. <laughs> According to sources, Chu's encounter with the crystalline a silicon solar receptor was his most regrettable dalliance since 2009 when an extended fling with a 90-foot wind turbine nearly ended his marriage. <laughs> so, how can I deal with this? 
So we did the usual Washington stuff. I said, I issued a statement. I just want everyone to know that my decision not to serve as a second term as Secretary of Energy has absolutely nothing to do with the allegations made in this week's edition of The Onion. Well, I'm not going to confirm or deny the charges specifically. I will say that clean renewable solar power is a growing source of U.S. jobs and is becoming more and more affordable. So it's no surprise that lots of Americans are falling in love with solar. And then my public affairs would not let me put in regards to sexual preferences. <laughs> so this is what I have to deal with. So, um, so that was the caveat of my over fondness with solar. Now, I just should also let you know my wife was very forgiving. She was actually more than forgiving. She looked and said, that's a fake. You don't have any hair on your chest. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so the cost of modules, again, another learning curve. Um, $100, $10, $1 per watt. Uh, this is the silicon one. It has bumps and wiggles due to very lavish, uh, generous subsidies of Germany, then oversupply or correction. Um, a couple years ago, we made a prediction that this would be the cost at this delivery rate, but it, we were wrong. The spot price market for solar modules today is about $0.86 cents a watt. Uh, not a dollar, and it occurred a couple of years earlier. Okay, now it's it will it will fall, probably fall back on this learning curve because the price will stabilize a little while. There's going to be a shakeout in the market, and then it will continue. However, the technological headroom is still there for at least ten years. Okay, which is very important, and this is the thin film solar technology that's current price. So so this is this has gone from twenty dollars to eighty six cents since 1975, okay? This is good. Now, 2004, the full cost of installation, the module, the electronics, the hookup, everything, for a utility scale was $8. By 2010, it was under $4. It's, um, and now we looked at it and we said, okay, how do you look at all the little pieces? Can we get it so it'd be a dollar watt? Why a dollar watt? That's six and a half cents levelized cost of new generation. Natural gas at four to five dollars a million BTU, which is very low, it's not as low as it is today, but the price has to come up or they're, they're, stop, they're stopping to explore. So the long-term prediction is it's gonna be four, six, seven, something like that. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be lower than what the EIA projects. I think it'll be between four and six dollars for 20 years, but we'll see. But if we use four to six dollars natural gas, the cost of a new gas turbine, what's the level of cost of a new generation? It's about six cents. Okay, wind will get to six cents within 15 years. And solar might get to at least seven cents or eight cents, but they're very ambitious six and a half cents, okay? And solar is, f but that's utility scale solar. It will be 12 cents um, for rooftop, okay? So, and, um, let me, so we looked at all the costs. We looked at the module costs. We looked at what's happening there. We're in comfortable ground there. There are what's called soft costs. This is the licensing fee, the roof inspection, the installation fee. You might have to brace your roof, whatever, stuff like that. People tromping on your shingles um, uh, and post inspection, all that stuff. So these are soft costs. They're not the cost of the hardware. They're not the cost of the module of the electronics, okay? Um, and so Min Lee, the current program manager, Sunshot, said, unlike physics, where we can fundamentally figure out the upper limit for efficiency of solar cells, there's no such limit to bureaucracy. <laughs> and so we're now a large, we're focusing on reducing those soft costs, the licensing fees, all the stuff that towns make you go through. Uh, why do we think there's room for improvement? In the U.S., it costs five dollars five fifty a watt to install solar. In Germany, it costs two dollars and fifty cents. The module cost is an is an international commodity price. The electronics are essentially a commodity price. It's the installation and the fees. So, of course, it's German labor is much cheaper. <laughs> okay, so we 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 we're gonna help we're gonna help uh, the U.S. What do we know how to do? We can install water heaters. Doesn't cost, you don't have to get a permit. You hire a plumber. 
you go to Costco or you hire a plumber to do the whole thing or you buy it from Home Depot or someplace. Um, either a hot word here or now, if you look at the relative dangers of these two things, carbon monoxide poisoning, explosion, gas leak. The other, leaky roof. <laughs> okay, we can figure this out. <laughs> okay, and to lower those costs. So we're working on it. Um, now, when we started Sunshot three years ago, uh, the industry thought, oh, you guys are smoking. You know, you're not going to get to a dollar watt utility scale or two dollars a watt residential. And said, no, this is our plan. We talked to them, worked with them, and said, no. And uh, last year we had a Sunshot thingy uh, workshop. And the industry said, you know what? You're probably right. You challenge us to go back and look at our business models, and we can do much better. So it was very gratifying. It took a year and a half. But just, no, 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 we've been thinking about this. You know, there's, there's no reason why you can't, uh, fundamentally. And, and so to hear, hear people like um, uh, some of the real gurus in the solar business, uh, who the biggest Christmas solar company in the United States, tell me personally, nope, it's going to work, and you were right. It is the EV everywhere? We're getting the same reaction. We just launched this a few months ago. From the moment, now, you're smoking something. You can't can get okay. It is a very ambitious goal. I don't pretend that $125 a kilowatt hour is very ambitious. I would be personally happy. Shh if it's $200, but it would be because it, it would still transform it. And so let me just remind you of something Michelangelo said. He said, the greater danger for most of us lies in not setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. Okay, so this is what we've been trying to do in the Department of Energy, but also work with industry not to, you know, that we're smoking. All right, let me return back to climate change as I close this. First, I think we have a moral responsibility because the most innocent victims uh, in climate change are the poorest who never contributed anything to this and those yet to be born. Number two, uh, there's an ancient Native American saying, we do not inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrowed from our children. And number three, you know, can you imagine 30 years from today I might be dead 30 years from today, probably will be, but where my children or your children, including the students, will say, what were they thinking of 2012 and 2015? Didn't they care about us? Okay, so back to the picture. Christmas Eve, 1968. It was the first mission of Apollo that went around, uh, orbited the moon in prepare, preparation for the and 1969 landing. And in the last orbit, they turned the capsule back to Earth, and they took this picture. It's called Earthrise. And what you see is a very bleak lunar landscape, pretty inviting Earth. And guess what else? Black. Nowhere else to go. Now, the astronaut who took this picture, Bill Landers, said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Since that time we discovered we're changing the Earth. So we've got to work on fixing that part, or at least slowing it up. Certainly we're going to have to do adaptation. But, but there's another famous saying, you know, if you don't change your direction, you might end up where you're going. Okay, and that's where we might be going. Last, last picture, last thing. Uh, this is a photograph of Voyager 1. Uh, it was launched in the mid-70s. As it was leaving the orbit of Pluto, uh, Carl Sagan convinced the NASA people to turn the cameras backward. It was going flybys, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, all those planets. It's still, by the way, functioning. Voyager 1 is still functioning. It's still out there. It takes a long time to communicate. It's low board rate. But it's now going out to where the magnetic field is the boundary between the Earth's magnetic field and the solar wind. Okay, It's now crossing that. So then it really is leaving kind of, you know, the, no, sorry, this is not the Earth's wind. This is the solar system. Okay. 
So um, that see that little thing circled there? You probably can't see it. It's circled in blue, and 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 these rainbows are such as long exposure faint photograph of the light. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a kind of a lens rainbow effect you get in cameras when you when you either bright sunlight or overexposure. This is uh, a much abbreviated quote that Carl Sagan wrote. I encourage you to go to the web. You can have the audio rendition of that. It's, but he said, um, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, so on, on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come elsewhere to save us from ourselves. So he goes on to say that we have to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. Folks, uh, the secretary is graciously. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. It's graciously allowed us to have you guys ask a couple questions. So we'll start with the first one here. Thank you for that. Um, so you just showed us some great information about the technology, and um, I'm just curious and and the economics of that technology and that it is feasible. So your thoughts after your time in politics and what are the political realities? Because this requires long-term thinking and we're kind of in a cycle of short-term fiscal cliffs and things like that so well what's the it, political reality? well the um what we're focused on in the department is to improve technology uh, just like re appliances um so that it's the low-cost option uh we're not looking for the forever subsidy option the wind uh group OEA, the american wind industry group uh, says, you know, the, they extended production tax credit two more years, and they said that we don't need it after that. Um, uh, solar, there's an investment tax credit that will go away in, by the end of 2016. I don't think they'll need that. They're, but what I'd like to do in terms of policy is in taking away the, uh, you know, solar investment tax rate at 30%, it goes back to a standard 10%, and everything else would be fine. But what I'd like to do, I'm tr trying to argue, is that there are other uh, policies that would stimulate private investment that would be the same as fossil fuel. So there's, um, if you wanted, there are things called you know partnerships, S corporations. For those of you who are not tax geeks, that's a very complicated structure uh, uh, that allows a small group of individuals to invest in something. It's not a corporate headquarters thing. It's just a small group. It's like a partnership of lawyers and stuff, stuff like that. Um, but they're called. There are other investment tools called mastered limited partnerships. This is one example where. You or I can invest in a master limited partnership, uh, just individuals or a pension fund or something like that. So it's open to private investors. Uh, it means that a larger class of society gets to be able to participate at whatever level you want. You, you don't buy in in a million bucks or you know $100,000. You can buy shares. Um, and if we were allowed to form massive limited partnerships for renewable energy, solar and wind, Stan, you know, standard technologies, proven technologies. They, what happens is they then put in a couple hundred megawatts. They, before they put it in, they sign what's called a power purchase agreement, usually for 20, 25 years. A utility company agrees to buy at a certain rate. So the risk is during the project, if you mess up in the project construction or something like that, but after that, it's, kind of solid money because it's not radically new technology. It's been around for 15 years. The massive limited partnership, so I, I would argue I would like uh, renewables to have massive limited partnerships. So what are the companies or industries that where massive limited partnerships are allowed? Oil, gas, 
coal gas pipelines. That's it. I just want to level the playing field. Remarkably, the aforementioned don't want renewables to get it. That's a policy that, that's a very low cost option that is very, very low cost to the government, essentially, okay? But it stimulates private investment. Meanwhile, we help drive the efficiencies down and reliability up and all this other stuff. And so it's private sector investment in the end that's going to move the ball. That's why we're so focused on making the cars better, the wind turbines better, the solar better. We're not interested in long-term public subsidies. That ain't going to do it in the end. And quite candidly, you know, I was asked this, you know, uh, in one of the many hearings, why, you know, we've been subsidizing wind and solar for so long, you know, when do you think it should stop? And I said, um, I don't think it needs in, you know, 10 years max, eight years, five years. But I tell you what, uh, oil's had it for 100 years. Uh, renewals were had it since the mid-1970s. They can get it for 50 years. And them both. <laughs> one for 100 years, one for 50 years. That's okay, too. <laughs> okay? We're getting close. Now, this is the reason why a whole bunch of country, countries are saying five or 10 years down the road when this thing gets to this price, or 15 years, might, might be longer. It isn't 30, you know. Um, it, those who own the technology have a world market. And this is something some of the people in the United States don't fully understand, uh, but because it's being muddied by the incumbent industries who don't want it replaced. But the people who want to invest in these things certainly understand this. China certainly understands this. China is now the largest deployer in their country of renewable energies. They just passed the United States. They're, but they also want the world market. You know, the manufacturing in the country and the deploying in the country also generates the world market. We Okay, uh, they're very aware of this. Now, some people say, well, they may make a bad bet and may not turn out to pass. That's maybe true. We bet on airplanes after World War I. We thought it was important. Uh, I thought it was a good bet. So the U.S. government helped stimulate private sector investment. They let airplanes carry the precious U.S. mail because they knew that Mail first, passengers later. <laughs> yeah, they could crash. Uh, and, and so they, they set up very wise things. The railroads, transcontinental railroads. There was a heavy subsidy. You know, Lincoln, Lincoln signed the Railway Act in the middle of the Civil War. And within 10 years, a transcontinental railroad was built. Okay, during the middle of the Civil War. During the middle of the Civil War, he started a land-grant institution. I think Iowa State's one of them. But what? Why did he start this? This is a moral act. He started like, uh, near Gettysburg time. The darkest days of the Civil War, he started this because he said in the long term, we will need institutions that can help in the practical engineering arts, in agriculture and in engineering. Here's a few other land-grant institutions. MIT, Cornell, Berkeley. What did they do? They gave them a hunk of land, and the state, it doesn't have to be in that state. MIT got some lumber in Wisconsin, I think, and they can use that as income producing to su support either agriculture or engineering. In the middle of the Civil War, he had a long-term view. Okay, so you think fiscal cliff is bad today. I think things were worse during the Civil War time. And yet, yet the leadership had a long-term view of what to do in transcontinental railroads. And so we got to get back that mojo. Okay. Um, so tonight's State of the Union, Marco Rubio is going to be giving the GOP rebuttal. Um, he's a known uh, climate denier, climate skeptic, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it seems like in the House and Congress, there's a rising number of people that are, are starting to go on the way of denying climate change, as the evidence suggests it. Uh, what are you doing? I wasn't really talking about climate deniers. Well, I was just giving data. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you doing to, uh, <laughs> to kind of correct this misinformation? Give to more data. <laughs> explain, explain the science. 
Um, I've talked, there was one person in Congress who was a climate denier, and he said, look, if you want, come to my office. I'll talk to you about it. And he went to this. I believe in the farmer's all market. This is a, he said, what about sunspots? I had that slide. I said, let me show you about sunspots. And he looked at this and said, hmm, I got to think about that. So, so what else can you do? You, you present data, unbiased data, okay? You, you know, and the, the, what, what many people who are non-scientists don't understand the way science works. They think it might be a fad. They think it might be stuff like this. But it actually, it could be. But, but for those of you who are scientists or budding scientists, um, if you prove or you work on something that agrees with some you know, the mainstream of what science is, you, you, yeah. if you come along and show that Einstein was wrong, that theory of relativity is incomplete, it needs something additional to that, and it stands the test of time, it's just not a crackpot crazy thing, but after other scientists replicate your work and everything, it turns out you're right. You get a Nobel Prize. You become immortal. You don't think that's a big incentive? <laughs> Uh, so there's a check, a very strong check in the core of science that says um, uh, you get more famous for showing something that is generally believed to be incorrect that stands the test of time. But, but a denier, and you know, they're, not, they're not talking about data. Okay? So, so the only thing I can do is just act like a scientist and just talk about data and talk about, you know, and, and oh, by the way, you don't have to say all these terrible things are going to happen. There, there's a, suppose there's a 50% chance that half of it will be true, okay? Yeah, I think it's more than 50%, but it's even 50%. So it would be prudent risk management to do something, okay? Just you know, if, if you got an airplane and you said, thank you for flying X Airlines, uh, you know, we appreciate your business, but there's a 10% chance the plane might crash, what would you do? You'd take some action. You might want to get off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> if you bought a house and, and there's a structural inspection and then the structural engineer says, you know what, the wiring is, you may love the house, it's charming and everything, but if you buy the house, you've got to rewire the house because I can't guarantee it, but there may be an electrical fire in five, 10 years. So what do you do? You, you love the house, but rewiring costs $20,000, so what do you do? You get another estimate. And suppose you get the same. Do you shop around for the one in 10,000 that will say, no, it's okay? Do you say I'll be current on my fire insurance? No, because the house might catch fire when your family's sleeping. You rewire. Okay, that's prudent risk management. There's no guarantee the house will catch fire. But it's a, a risk that you don't want to take. And so this is the way I think you should think about it. Uh, and, and don't confuse uncertainty, because the error bars are large in what might happen, with inaction. So that's where we are now. Uh, even though there's a big uncertainties, you've got to prudent risk management says you've got to do some stuff. The costs which appear to be, you know, the weather, extreme weather events which were predicted and they're correlated and everything else, and it's not a coincidence, this is 32 years now. 170 billion, of which probably 120 is U.S. losses, most of it uninsured. The flood insurance, it, taxpayers don't know this, but the flood insurance is um, not done by insurance companies through the premiums pay for the flood insurance. It's backed by the U.S. government. After Katrina, uh, it went, it's 90 billion in the red, and now after Sandy, it's gonna be another 60 billion in the red or something like that, or 50, you know, it's enormous. And US taxpayer monies, because the people who live on coast can't afford the real insurance costs. So it's heavily subsidized. And then when we have more extreme events, it gets paid for by US taxpayers. Okay, so I'm talking about small stuff, you know, a million here, a million there, tens, you know. But we're, we're spending billions, hundreds of, 50 billion a year. You know, it's just kind of weird. It's not good economics. 
So that's that's all I can say is that all I can do is show some facts. They could, it's the open literature, referee journals, all that stuff. The rest of it doesn't make it into referee. They're blogs. Right. Well, we'll fortunately, we'll have the last question over here. Hello, Mr. Secretary. Earlier on in your presentation, you half jokingly, I think, said that the government can't pick winners. Um, later, you did go on to discuss collaborations and partnerships between industry and uh, Department of Energy Labs and other government um, agencies. And I was wondering if you could explain how sure. those specific partnerships work. Well, let me, I, 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 okay, let's talk about what we mean by not pick winners. Uh, I don't like the idea of actually. Um, R&D, I'm fully supportive. The closer you get to deployment, the closer you get to direct funding companies, the less comfortable I am, number one. Number two, um, in solar, um, we don't really care. Uh, we want solar to be as cheap as natural gas, okay? And we think there's a good shot at it. So if you consider, but the specific approach, well, there's silicon, thin film, curfless, silicon, all that stuff, we don't care. We're agnostic, we're agnostic to whether you have solar concentrator or something, we don't care. We want to identify the best technologies. We will support many technologies. We're, we're supporting um, a dozen different battery technologies because we don't care. We do know that batteries, if they get to anything close to that price point, even $250, will be a world market. So in that sense, we, we have an intuition. It's just like the United States had an intuition airplanes would be important certainly for national security, but maybe for other things. So in that sense, are we picking a winner? Maybe. But fine-tuned, the type of solar technology, the type of battery, the type, no. We're very agnostic to that. Okay, so just, because that's sometimes misunderstood. Uh, now, it goes against the free market purism, uh, but there are market failures in the free market. No one, the economists don't like that data that shows that the first price cost when standard start goes down. They, they have no theory for that. Okay? That's a market failure. That's a gross market failure. You know, even if it stayed the same and the, and the efficiency went up, is a gross market failure. International fishing is a market failure over fishing. There's lots of stuff that are market failures. And, and the other thing is energy is heavily regulated in the world in various forms. So, so it, it itself is not free market. I would want it to be more you know, open and things like that. So your question about universities and national labs, um, what we try to do is uh, you do try to uh, identify where especially in the R&D side where, where taxpayers, it's just like kind of Iowa State tries, you know, they don't have an open door policy, I don't think. <laughs> Anyone who can, okay? They, 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 you apply and there's a selection process. Is that considered picking winners and losers? Maybe so. I don't know. But, you know, there's got to be a selection process of what you invest in. And so it's, you know, but, but I, I'm, the research and development part, companies can't recoup the, all the research investments. If you have a very powerful near monopoly company like an IBM or AT&T Bell Labs, AT&T, you could do that, but in the most recent past, those, well, AT&T is not the same AT&T anymore. It actually, it just has the name. It got a, a little smaller spinoff of AT&T bought AT&T. <laughs> um, but um, so the research and development that used to be done in the great national laboratories like GE and IBM and Bell Labs and RCA and Xerox, uh, even GM, much more nose to the grindstone, immediate stuff, not learn term. So that is a natural role, I think, of government. Okay. Uh, once you start making hundreds of millions of dollars in this company, X or Y and Z, I get less comfortable. I, I prefer not. We shouldn't be in that business. We should be in the business of, I think, like master limited partnerships. Let the private sector make that decision. 
of that investment. If someone wants to invest a couple hundred million dollars in this or that, just make level the playing field, give them the same tax breaks as the other people, and that's it. Uh, you do need subsidies in a really beginning industry, I agree, absolutely. Uh, but solar is no longer beginning, and I, you know this started since 1978, seven or eight. You know the oil crisis shock of that. You know, and so you know wind also. So, but the United States dropped, and Europe took the lead, and they put in a long-term policy that meant Germany and uh, 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 Netherlands took the lead. G bought a company, a subsidiary of actually uh, uh, Enron. Uh, and and it started putting engineering muscle behind it. So, but 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 until G, that you know, there's a few other American industries or, or small players. But so I think, in the deployment side, uh, especially at scale, I'd rather much prefer, you know, you know, little tweaks in tax code to guide private investment. But R and D for sure, that's a proper government role. With that, unfortunately, our time with the Secretary must end. Thank you all so much for coming this afternoon and joining me in thanking the Secretary of Energy.